There he is. Usher Quentin Tarantino right in, hey, right in, Tarantino, sir. fuck yeah. How you doing, man? <laughs> That's what oh, I yeah. said. How you doing? Good, good to see you, buddy. mate. Pleasure. How hey, you been, how, good? How, how, how do you guys know each other? Well, I don't really know. I didn't know of him. I've seen his specials on uh, HBO. Son oh, nice. of a bitch. Well. And, and we, did, we did Leno together once. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, you know, oh, it's just a couple different. of guys who enjoy each other's work, a couple similar of big stars. Elk. Yeah, yeah right. of similar elk. <laughs> we, just, we just hate when people recognize him. We really don't like that at all. It goes all. to his head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I remember you on the, the Louis C.K. show that was on Showtime, I think. HBO, yeah, yeah, yeah Lucky HBO. Louis. Yeah, oh. and um, and I had never seen you before when I saw you on that, and then I just happened to be turning the dial on about eight months later, and I saw your stand. I came in the middle of your stand-up special, and I pissed my pants. Oh, I thanks, it was man. So oh, man. funny. Thank you, man. Thanks. Wow. Oh, God great. damn it. I'm very happy. <laughs> you know about old. you know about your Golden Globes. I just literally on the drive okay. here about uh, three blocks ago just found out Damn, about it. Damn, I thought I was going to break it to you. <laughs> that was, uh, nominated which, for five Golden Globes, yeah. Quentin Tarantino. Wow, for for Django. Great. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I think, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, where I guess uh, it was one of the – Harvey Weinstein was saying, you know, he was saying, okay, the turning point's going to be tomorrow. We'll see. We'll be in the game in a big way come tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and you know. You want that, but you're also trying to manage expectations. So sure, you're not totally sure. bummed yeah. out when it doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> but this sounds like a pretty good year. Is that? Is yeah. that huh? <laughs> and that stuff is still exciting to you? Oh, it's totally exciting. Well, I worked real hard on the film and everything. Right. And actually, it's actually kind of fun to go to. Uh, it's fun to go to the Oscars. It's fun to go uh, to the Golden Globes and have a good time with your colleagues. Yeah. Nice. yeah. And to know that you're one of the guys that they're all focused on. It's, it's got to be a little bit bummy if, if you're like, there's no mention of you whatsoever. But when you're one of the guys, it's got to be even oh, better. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to keep a uh, perspective on it. I mean, some of my favorite movies have never been nominated or won mm -hmm. anything. All right, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Good and the Bad and the Ugly wasn't there. All right, uh -huh. uh, at the Golden Globes and wasn't there at the Academy Awards. I think it's the best movie ever made. Fantastic, Wild Bunch yeah. wasn't there at the Oscars. Uh, uh, you know, so you got to keep it in perspective. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly didn't win anything for. Nah, it was uh, it, it was considered Italian junk. Yeah, just a dumb, yeah. dumb little yeah. spaghetti western. Yeah, 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 exactly. like, like yeah, it didn't become a classic till later. Yeah, yeah. that is an amazing movie too. Uh, it's my Absolutely. favorite movie of all time. It, it really yeah. is, huh? This reminded yeah. me of a Sergio Leone vibe too. Because I saw Django last yeah. night, and, yeah. and the way the, t the way it was filmed, mm -hmm. like the colors of the film, and, uh, the head-on shots. Yeah. Uh, although there's a lot more blood in yours yeah, than there yeah. was in his. Well, you but, like the blood there. Clint. Yeah, well, yeah, but no, you know, but you know, in particular though, I was going off of a of a. Um, Spaghetti Western vibe of doing my mm -hmm. Western. That's probably my favorite subgenre in all of cinema, is Spaghetti Westerns. I'm a big fan of them. And so I knew when I did my Western, I would want it to have that kind of vibe, that kind of operatic music, and mm. that whole mm -hmm. larger than life aspect of it all. Yeah. Is it, is it rough to go from genre to genre? You've done that. I mean, mm. uh, and very successfully. Crime uh, movies, um, horror. Yeah. You've done, you know, you've done, you've done pretty much it all. What, do you have to really take a lot of time to adjust what you're doing? Well, I, I think, um, hmm. <laughs> Not really. I guess the adjustment happens during the writing of the script. Oh, okay. I mean, it might be actually a little different if I was going out there and just reading scripts and finding, oh, hey, here's a good Western I could do. Here's mm -hmm. a good detective movie I could do. I mean, that might be a little different or or the process would start then. But no, the process starts with like literally the blank piece of paper, uh -huh. you know, and yeah. me filling out 170 pages. All right. And having a script. So it's just, it all just comes down to the story. Do you, right, right. Do you write longhand still? or Absolutely. You do. Why? Can't write poetry on the computer, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You could really? creatively, you could think better if you just have yeah. the pen in your hand. No, right? that, that's exactly. Well, that's how I've always done it. And it's, you know, I've kind of. Yeah. I don't even know if I believe in God, but I do feel that you know, uh, my pen is my antenna to God as far as <laughs> writing is concerned. But you know, uh, actually, the process, the way the process has kind of evolved, though, is uh, I actually ignored this this part of the process for about uh, for like the middle point of my career and got back to it on Inglorious Bastards and now I'm like how could I have ever stopped doing mm. this was um, when I wrote Reservoir Dogs I, I wrote it out and normally when I'd written something before I couldn't type I, I would talk friends into typing things up for me well I used my last friend as far as that was concerned <laughs> yeah, enough, of know, this. Okay, enough yeah. of this typing <laughs> shit alright <laughs> I'll drive you to the airport I'll help you move but fuck typing your shit yeah. <laughs> and fair enough <laughs> so uh, uh, in that case I wrote Reservoir Dogs longhand and I had to type it up 
And uh, uh, I couldn't type. And I didn't even have a typewriter. I borrowed my girlfriend at the time, her little Smith Corona wow. word process from 1987. Her Smith Corona word processor slash typewriter with like a little floppy disk with a memory of 30 pages on it. <laughs> oh, for kid, college kids doing papers. <laughs> and so I borrowed it and I just typed it up one finger at a time. And that's kind of and that's how I did Pulp Fiction. And uh, I kind of got away from that, and I went back to it again in uh, on, in Glorious Bastards. Uh, again, you actually I using her Smith Corona word processor. All right, uh, I'm kind of superstitious about that. Also, it's idiot proof. I can't fuck it up on that. Thing, That's you know? true. Yeah. Uh, but you know, literally, the whole process of me writing by hand. When I now have to type it up by one finger and just literally, I don't even, I don't trust it to hold anything from memory. So I print up every page as I finish. It. Oh, wow. Okay. Good idea. But yeah. you know, it's, um, that, that's an important part of the process to me. That's like the, you know, that's the final draft coming out mm -hmm. there. I mean, cause I do tend to, I think people do, you tend to overwrite when you're writing by hand cause it's just cost you nothing. To just blah 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 with the pen, but when you gotta type it up with one <laughs> finger, it's better be if some the important shit stuff. ain't motherfucking Shakespeare, it's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of it like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it better be important. It better be good. <laughs> <laughs> Typing stinks. Uh, it's the worst. <laughs> wow. Did you write the script and then pitch to Harvey Weinstein, or did he say I want you to write something about this, or did you say I'm thinking about something with slavery, or how did that happen with him? No, I. I never do a pitch kind of thing i um uh, the only reason you do pitches is if you're like want to be paid for writing your script i don't want to be paid for writing my script i want people to buy my script i want to you know we're going to make this movie when i'm done so i want to own it up up until the you know up until the financing is concerned so i always write it on spec i always just write it myself mm. it's mine and so then i don't have to explain it i don't have to sell anybody on it i give them the script they either like it or they don't and the movie is right there you know right, so you right. read it you know it's, what you see is what you get yeah. Mm. And you're getting a lot of uh, flack is like the Drudge Report because the word nigger was used a lot. Mm. And I, m my take on it was it was used a lot, but it, <laughs> but it almost felt like in this day and age, it's such a shocking word mm -hmm. that you desensitized people to it, which kind of fits that time. Like mm -hmm. that is how it was used in that time. <laughs> Man, if, you, if, if 15 years from now they create a... <laughs> you know what? You're the N word. In 15 years from now, if they create time travel, don't go back to the antebellum South. <laughs> it's kind of a fucked up time. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and if you don't think it was used uh, if, uh, as much, if not more, mm -hmm. you know, and that actually kind of really is my answer to the question is like, what do you think that I overused it compared to how it was used <laughs> yeah, in the antebellum exactly. South? Yeah. If not, shut up. You showed how, I think it was Good brilliant. for you, by the way. You showed how comfortably right. people, you because like to hear people saying that type of stuff with black people at the table, mm -hmm. it's jarring. But that's oh, that's yeah. how it was. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, like for, you know, you, you've got uh, you've you've got that whole upstairs downstairs situation going on with mm -hmm. you know the house servants and then the people who uh, uh, and, and the you know the people who's uh, the, who own the plantation and you and you have like a, a kind of like the sort of like honor guards. They're standing behind every every guest waiting mm -hmm. to you know uh, right. you know those three girls that yeah. are behind the uh, behind the, the diners and. They're furniture. Oh, they're not shit. people. They are furniture. They were referred to as furniture. Jesus they're not Christ. supposed to make. They're not supposed to do anything. They're not supposed to make any living things. It's just, just somebody, somebody needs salt. They give salt. Take the plate away. Pour more wine. Just supposed to be furniture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It was really amazing when you show because you, you would get like a huge laugh in the scene. I was amazed that you got laughs addressing slavery, mm -hmm. and then the next moment. It jumps to a, a tremendously sad moment. I think emotionally, this I was up. I cried watching this movie. Nice. It's by far the most emotionally amazing thing you've done. I, oh, thank you. I couldn't believe how many different places you took me with it. Well, I really, I really like orchestrating, uh, kind of um, orchestrating the audience's feelings mm -hmm. and their emotions. Like mm -hmm. I kind of almost feel like if I'm doing my job to the fullest of my ability, I should be like. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 oh, conductor. Conductor, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I almost I said painter. Shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should be. I, I should be like. I should be like a symphony conductor, and the audience's reactions mm. are my orchestra. <laughs> Wow, yeah. And I mean, you know, and now, now that's a heavy <laughs> that's a heavy duty thing to want to try to do and then when I get no response, you know, at certain screenings, oh. I know I have completely failed. Wow. Uh, you know, uh uh cuz I oh, there should be a laugh here or there should be a this. Mm. But you know, to me really part of the thrill is to just be mixing those emotions and taking you up and down, and especially trying to do it with comedy where it's like laugh, 
laugh, laugh, stop laughing, uh -huh. stop laughing, horror, suspense, <laughs> laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be very difficult to do when you're when you're writing something because you can't just go from certain things into laughing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I yeah. mean, there's there's uh, last night at the um, twelve 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 concert, there was a prime example mm -hmm. of a complete fuck up as far as that's concerned. They went from a filmed piece about some horrific, you know, destruction and people uh, losing their houses, and some woman is literally screaming and going, "And we lost everything!" everything. And, and it stopped dead, and then the announcer goes, "Ladies and gentlemen, Chris." It's wrong. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, that, it was like I, ah. I, I felt the exact same. Thing. I was like, this poor bastard. Oh, you know he's oh. thinking, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. And Chris is standing like, like what, what the, the fuck, fuck did you do to me? What did I do to you? Yeah. So this guy on the company style is uh, Christopher <laughs> Rowe. Yeah. It was terrible. So there's got to be some kind of, you know, kind of uh, leading into you gotta yeah. bridge where that you're stuff, going. Right? Yeah, 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 bridge it, right. Yeah, you've you've always done that very very well, and getting laughs out of things that are like horrific at the moment. The prime example, of course, you've heard a thousand times in Reservoir Dogs: The Ear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, the guy yeah. gets his ear cut off—a horrific scene. <laughs> and then when uh, Michael Madsen starts to hello, hello, can you hear me? He's talking into the ear. You can't help but laugh as you're fucking horrified. Right. You know. And since he's uh, was last here, we've met Michael Madsen. Uh -huh, yeah. Huh? He's nuts, right? <laughs> you, you always knew, did. You always know know that he was nuts. <laughs> We love him, by the way. Yeah, yeah. He's an, a oh, very he's honest man. He's gotten a little more nuts. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I say that with nothing right. but love and affection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he, had to tone it, he had to tone it down to play Mr. Blue. <laughs> <laughs> One of our favorite moments on the show, he came in and then he went through all his movies that he's uh, done recently mm -hmm. and explained why he did each movie. Oh, and wow. it was brutal. Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I, owed, I, I owed child support. <laughs> this was for a mortgage. <laughs> this was, I owed a... I don't know. I would love uh, if you it guys could, if you guys could yank that out of the files for me. Mm. I would love to hear it. that. Sounds like really funny. Michael going through his straight to video yeah, filmography. Yeah. Oh, why he did him? Hysterical. <laughs> he didn't hold back at all, man. <laughs> now he's you know. It was the first time someone finally admitted that they actually do movies because yeah. they owe a little money. And right. Like all right, fuck it, I got to do this one. He's 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 a great guy. He's yeah. a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love him. Don't yeah. get, oh, I know, I know, don't, I know. Don't confuse yeah. the vibe. We, I get no. I'm not not at all. Well, we know he's coming in. We we. Get very excited. Yeah, you, it's it's obvious you guys okay, have appreciation yeah, yeah, yeah. for love. Him. <laughs> uh, when he's a great actor. Growing up, obviously you you must have seen the black black exploitation movies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was in those? Because uh, he's God. He he played uh, in the, uh, this. Uh, Rudy Ray Moore did a bunch of those. Ghost of Nigger Charlie was one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Fred Williamson. Yes, yeah. Fred Williamson. No, it's called the Legend of Nigger. Legend, Charlie. right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They made a, did they make a couple they of those? They made two. They made, yeah, they made yeah. two of them. The Legend of Nigger Charlie and Soul of Nigger Charlie. Soul, right, right, right. That well, was you know, well, The Legend of Nigger Charlie was really kind of important. It's, 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 it's not a, it's, 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 it's not a bad movie. It's hampered mm -hmm. by the fact that it has almost no budget whatsoever. Right. Uh, but I mean, it was still released by Paramount. I think the Paramount logo costs more, all right, <laughs> than, uh, the movie. But, but it was unique in, uh, and pretty much unique up, up until the time that this movie was made. Mm -hmm. It's the only movie that shows us uh, that that uh, uh, depicts a slave narrative where a slave gets right. a gun, kills you know, uh, uh, kills overseers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and you know, uh, leads a Western style revolt. Right. Not not a Nat Turner turn over the plantation kind of revolt, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, uh, they take over a town and fight a bunch of uh, 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 ragtag Confederates. Right. Yeah. That that kind of reminds me of. Uh... Well, it was what you done. Uh, yeah, done. it's well. It was funny because you know there was a little tiny bit of that just even in my thought process when I wrote this film because I remember one of the producers of my movie is Reginald Hudlin, uh, who is a director who directed House Party, Boomerang, mm. and uh, we were talking about another movie that dealt with slavery, and he was talking about how he didn't care for it. He said movie made with the best intentions in the world, but ultimately. It's unsatisfying. And he was giving the reasons why he thought it was unsatisfying. And uh, he goes, look, even though this movie was made with the best intentions in the world, as far as black folks are concerned, The Legend of Nigger Charlie is far more empowering. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I guess that the movie was Amistad and the reason he didn't like it was because it focused too much on the white heroes? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Look at Jimmy Norton. Jimmy. <laughs> I can't think of any of the modern day slavery movies. Check out the big brain on Jim. <laughs> <laughs> 
Very good. Yeah, boy. I, I, was, I was amazed that the slavery was addressed so, like, mm. you, you, you didn't trivialize it. Like, even though there was big laughs, and I mean funny, with fucking harsh language, <laughs> that when you went to one of those horrifying scenes, like, just say there's a hot box scene, which I didn't even know existed back then, mm. it is, it's horrifying and it's mm. gut-wrenching, and, but, but it doesn't feel manipulative. It doesn't feel like you're trying to make people cry. It really feels like you're giving an honest picture. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and that sequence, because, you know, who's in the hot box is uh, Django's woman, who he's going to going mm. to rescue, uh, played by Kerry Washington, Broomhilda. And, uh, you know, there is kind of a two thing situation is going on. He's he's gone to the pit of hell. To extract her from this this place in Mississippi, where like you know, as far as I'm concerned, all of Antebellum South is hell, but Mississippi is the asshole of hell. <laughs> uh, and uh, and he goes down there, and uh, and when they sees that she's in the hot box, shit is even worse <laughs> than he thought it was. But at the same time, it also tells the audience she's in the hot box because she tried to escape. She's tried to get out of here. Mm-hmm. She can't. <laughs> mm. Right, right. Oh man. Yeah, it was just really chilling That's and brutal. Absolutely. And uh yeah. I, I, I love the fact that uh the laughs would come after there was an immediately s- a sad scene and I can't understand as a writer how you take that risk. I know you've addressed mm-hmm. that already, but mm-hmm. like what balls to put like the like Don Johnson is big daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the lines he had coming from yeah, the yeah. top of the steps got laughs. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 Holy the, shit! <laughs> well, it's kind of funny, all right. When he is the, when he's when, he, when he's addressing the the slave girl to show Janko around the ground. Yeah. and uh, and he, uh, and uh, he has to remind uh, her that Django isn't a slave; that he's a free man. But she doesn't quite understand the concept. <laughs> All right, uh, so he's trying to explain it to her, and and she goes, "What you mean? You want us to treat him like white folks? No, that's not what I said." <laughs> I got a huge laugh. <laughs> oh, God, so what? what a great line! Hilarious. <laughs> oh my God, is is that difficult for an actor? Uh, uh, to you know, spew out horrid racial epithets, and mm-hmm. uh, even though you're acting, mm-hmm. but. There's such sensitivity in this day and age um, with with race to stand there right in front of somebody Mm -hmm. that's black and to be just blurting out racial epithets. Is that difficult as an actor? Well, I guess if it was difficult for them, I probably wouldn't have cast them. I mean, Mm. I mean, we all we're all doing a job. We all know why we're there. Everybody has read the script. I mean, Sidney Putty used to actually talk about that. Mm. His first big movie was a movie called No Way Out with a a Richard Widmark. And Mm. in that movie, Richard Widmark just says the most vile (laughs) stuff to him. And Richard Widmark was one of the biggest liberals of the of the the fifties. And you know he. Proved it by constantly starring in movies with Sidney Poitier. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that film, you know, he would, he would like, oh, I'm really, you know, they'd do a take and he'd say everything and then there would be a cut. Oh, I'm sorry, Sidney. Oh, this really? And, this and, this. and Sidney Poitier had like, I read the script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it was a surprise, I didn't not... just show up and we were just freestyling. It was, <laughs> I read the script. Yeah, Richard Whitmark was ad libbing the yeah. script <laughs> at craft services. <laughs> <laughs> just thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of, if, if you're going to, you would be the wrong person to play the role if you're uh-huh. going to be that self conscious about it. Your job isn't to apologize to the people around you, your job is to be that guy. It, yeah, you know, and to channel him and and be his spokesperson, good or bad. That's got to be an actor's mind, though, because it mm-hmm. just seems like it. There, it's such a sensitive issue mm-hmm. that it would just feel odd to do that. Well, here's the thing, though. It's like uh, it's one thing to do it opposite the other actors in the mm-hmm. film and everything. Like I said, we've, we've gone through rehearsal. We all know what <laughs> right, we're doing, right, yeah. all right? But to to Keep that mindset of your character. Uh, I'm not talking about some like uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm in character all the time. You have to talk to me like this way, or that way. I'm not talking about that. But just you know, you're not trying to break out of the mindset. You're trying to keep in the mindset. We, we have a whole bunch of black crew members to actually not apologize for your character because it's not your job to apologize for your character. Sure. To not apologize for your character and it just kind of keep the course there even with everyone around you know that 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 takes a lot of integrity and it takes a lot of a lot of artistic focus can i tell you who was and i mean brilliant and i fell in love with him again and he was repulsive his character dicaprio Mm -hmm. plays a repulsive guy (laughs) yeah i I couldn't believe the way he it's it's just because you you know he's leo dicaprio talking Mm -hmm. to these Mm -hmm. actors in this scene like that with just such 
like you said, like they were pieces of furniture. And, <laughs> and I know he's an actor, but it was still shocking to see him do it that well. No, he had just an incredible amount of focus for that character. I mean, uh, I think he needed that focus to really get to the heart of that guy mm. because he was just bound and determined that he wasn't going to play a villain. That doesn't mean the guy wasn't a bad guy. He's just not going to be... I'm not here to just serve the function in the movie of playing uh -huh. the bad guy. I'm going to give you who this guy is, and then everyone else can make up their mind. But I have to be true to this guy. And his um, incredible amount of focus on such a repugnant character, it was really, really commendable. <laughs> it sounds like the advice Christoph Waltz gave. There's a scene where uh, uh, Jamie Foxx has to kind of play a black slaver, mm -hmm. who, and they were just the most hated black. And, he, and Christoph Waltz says, well, then he's like, I don't know how to play this. He goes, well, play this guy dirty or play him yeah. Yeah, how that, you think he should yeah, be played. Yeah, he's like, you know, they're, they're horrible. That's the worst. Well, then do that. Give me that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the worst guy you've ever met. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> you, you, he get, you get great performances from these actors. Yeah. Well, why is that, you think? Because hmm. uh, well, it really stands out yeah. in a lot of your movies, oh, obviously. You. Well, you know, it all it kind of, I think it's a, it's a three pronged thing. You know, um, I write good characters, I write interesting mm -hmm. characters. Uh, I, then I cast them well. I cast them well. And uh, the part of casting well is usually, unless I'm writing it for somebody in particular, and sometimes that works out and sometimes that doesn't. Um, uh, it's about the character first. It's not the actor mm -hmm. first. I, my, I don't have an obligation to give a groovy actor a role. I have an obligation to find the best person to play my character. They're my characters. They came from deep in my DNA, and I want them to have the perfect person to play them. I'm not writing theater where you know everybody for right. the next twenty years gets a crack at it. <laughs> this is this is it. Uh, but <laughs> I think what you're saying there is other other directors break down and they go and they go with the groovy guy. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's, it's kind of easy to do. It's almost the whole industry seems to be heading that way. And usually, the groovy guy is groovy for a reason. So <laughs> right. All well and good. But if you really want it to be magical. Like, say, you know, Christoph Waltz as Londa, mm -hmm. then it's got to be a focus where I'm looking for the right guy and mm -hmm. only the right guy, only the right guy will do. And then you just add to the fact that, you know, I, I know how to deal with actors. I, for lack of a better word, I speak actor talk. So I know how to get the best out of them and take care of them. The, yeah. The fact that you, this amazing fantasy world that feels realistic is, is the star of the movie is Christoph. He's a German dentist who speaks with a German accent, and he and an ex-slave are running around killing white people. It's like, <laughs> you never would think that could be a masterpiece of a film, and then the way you've written it was absolutely believable, even though it seemed like these crazy things put together. Well, there is, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know kind of one of the tricks of the film is, you know, the movie really is... Uh, um, it's the most linear of all my, my stories. I don't kind of hop around. Oh, okay. I don't do the separate uh, chapter thing where I'm trying to hit hitting it from different different points of view or try to bring other characters and everything converges later mm. or effing with the time scheme. This was a journey. You have to kind of follow Django from page one to page 170 uh -huh. and really go on that journey with it if it's going to really work. But one of the things about that journey is the first hour is kind of fun. All right. The first hour, it's kind of like a Butch and Sundance yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, teamwork that, that's going on. And then that's when you and, but then after that's over and, you know, Django's got his bona fides, so to speak. Now he's ready to go into the hell of Mississippi to extract his woman. And that's when things start getting tough. Mm hmm. And what did you you talk about casting actors? What Don Johnson? What what an odd choice! Like what how, what was it that he had done in the past that you go? This guy is perfect to play this horrible slave master. Oh, well, see, actually, I've always been a big fan of Don Johnson. I mean, like ten years before Miami Vice, I, when I was a little boy, I would you know see some actor like on a TV show or something, and I would like them. Mm -hmm. I get to know who they were. I get their name, and I'd I'd see their name in the TV guide, and I would watch their movies or watch it when they guest it on Hawaii Five O or right, something like yeah, that yeah. <laughs> and follow their careers. And sometimes they actually became stars, <laughs> frankly. Um, but I was always a big fan of Don Johnson. He did a movie, um, he did a really great um, uh, car movie in the uh, uh, in the 70s called Return to Macon County with him oh, and Nick God, Nolte yeah. and he was terrific in it. He was the star of A Boy and His Dog, which is a great, great cult movie. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he, he, he did all kinds of TV movies all, you know, all through the 70s. So I was always a big fan of his. I always thought he could have been a star then. It just didn't work out. Then he hit big with Miami Vice. and I've always just uh, been a fan of his. So he came in and read and he was perfect for it. That's strange because I, I understand what you're saying about uh, I, w I would watch TV, mm -hmm. see somebody, and for some reason, I'd know, I'd be like, that's that 
person from the bologna commercial. Yeah, yeah. Like, I would yeah, yeah. know that yeah, that's yeah. that person. It's like, and you'd know them, and they'd pop up in other shows, and you'd be like, yeah, yeah. okay. And for some reason, I always thought that was kind of a special thing to be able to recognize that. And someone's going, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, you don't understand. Well, you know, I mean, it was funny because, you know, when I was a really, really little boy, like, you know, four or something yeah. like that, I'd watch uh, 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 TV movies with my uh, stepfather. Now, I didn't know anything about movies. I'm four. <laughs> I don't have a backlog yet. All right. Uh, so, you know, my... Uh, um, uh, boy, watching it with my stepdad Curtis, and uh, you know, see, so we're watching some movie. And he goes, "Okay, Quentin, you see that guy right there? It's Thomas Mitchell. He he was the father in the original Swiss Family Robinson from the '30s, not the Disney one we saw. <laughs> all right, but the but the original one. Oh, really? Huh? And then we see some other. Oh no, see, that's Roddy McDowell. He's a really good actor. I like him. But he was a star even when he was a little boy. He did a movie called National Velvet. You would you would like? I thought. My stepdad was a movie genius <laughs> because he just could point people on the TV and know their names. Well, we can all do that. I, 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 he was kind of the Leonard Malton guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, he could point out the people he knows and he likes. Right, right. right. But I actually thought, oh, well, I guess that's what happens is when you get to be an adult, you become a movie genius. <laughs> so I better start, like, you know, preparing. Right, right. <laughs> that's how it began. Did, did you ever have to explain? Explain who you're casting. Like some people going, well, look, Quentin, uh, that person's a weird choice. Like now, I couldn't imagine anyone second guessing you, your right. fucking <laughs> choices on who you're picking as actors. You're pretty much proven you know what you're doing. Uh, but has it been earlier? Like really, that guy? Uh, oh no no no! Early, especially yeah, especially with the way I was doing it. I mean, you know, the <laughs> most famous example is John Travolta. Absolutely. Nobody in the studio wanted John Travolta, and not only that. It was like it was considered a really hot script. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when he was turning everything down, Daniel Day Lewis expressed interest in mm. playing in playing Vincent. Uh, and I like Daniel Day Lewis, but I, I really wanted John. I had my, my heart set on wow. him. Wow. And and it's one wow. thing it's one thing Amazing. to want the guy who's out of fashion <laughs> when nobody else wants it. Right. But when there's actually a hot guy <laughs> yeah, you can one. get and you wanna go with, you know, <laughs> The guy from the 70s, the guy from Barbarino. <laughs> right. I, I want Vinny Barbarino. I want Barbarino. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's... Uh, how, how'd you talk him into it? Because I'm sure there was well, some you know, pushback. Yeah, it was finally... Um, well, the truth in those, it was kind of a two-pronged thing. Uh, one was the fact... I was just kind of tough on it insofar as they really wanted to do the movie. And I just said, look, if uh, I want to go this way. And if you don't agree that this is the way to go, then maybe we shouldn't make this movie together. I should maybe make it with somebody else because mm. we just kind of just don't agree. Uh, and it wasn't a take, take it or leave it kind of situation. Right. It was like, look, uh, I think he's a terrific actor. I think what you should do is you should watch him and Brian De Palma's blowout. And if you don't think he's a terrific actor, then maybe we should talk about should we be doing this movie together. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it. All right. Uh, uh, it wasn't a threat. It was just that we're just not really on the right page. And you're not coming up with anybody else. <laughs> right. That is a legitimate uh, uh, you know, uh, alternative as far as I'm concerned. And um, so, you know, it, 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 it kind of was that. But then also, frankly, once we got Bruce Willis, then mm -hmm. it was like we, we had our big movie star. Right, right. You know, we had our big movie star. It was a big role. It wasn't a cameo. And so, okay, okay, here All we right, go. All right, throw him yeah. in there. Let, yeah. we'll let and Bruce was, down, Bruce was down with John and everyone. And, you know, so that yeah. Was, yeah. So interesting how things worked out, yeah. right? Yeah. So was, was it, it yeah, what, was it little blowout? connections? Yeah. Was it blowout that turned you on? Because I was going to ask you, what did you see John in mm -hmm. that even gave you an inkling that he could do that part? Because I had never really seen him in anything that would give me the impression that he could have pulled off Vince Vega. Well, you know, um, when it, there, actually, I don't think there's anything about his character in Blowout that's similar to Vince no, Vega. No, not at all. Yeah, it's just he, it's a really good performance. Right. Okay. I mean, frankly, to tell you the truth, Vince Vega is. Kind of close to Barbarino a little bit. All right. yeah. If it's closer to any of his characters, it's yeah. Barbarino. Barbarino kind of murdered close. the sweat Barbarino. hogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think oh, it's, I think he's a little smarter than Barbarino, right. All right. <laughs> but not drastically. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, his you yeah. know, I, John Travolta is a really good comedian, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a funny movie. Yeah. It's a comedy, and um, and but you know, but literally, you know, his timing 
on Welcome Back, Hotter was really fantastic. It was a, he's a really good comedic actor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, frankly, it's growing up watching him as uh, Welcome Back, Hotter. But also, not only that, though, aside from just that, there was... Um, there was this aspect. John Travolta is a movie star. Just because everyone in Hollywood had forgotten about it, that just shows how dumb they are. Oh, that's true. I actually yeah. walked down the street with John Travolta at his lowest <laughs> ebb uh, uh, in pre-production of the movie, and people would lose their minds <laughs> when he see him. We'd walk into a regular restaurant, and we had to leave. Grease, because, Saturday yeah, Night Fever. Yeah, people, I mean, you know, the, huge, the of tourist course. in Hollywood would see him and just lose their mind. It's like. People are dying to see him in something worth watching. Mm. It's just stupid Hollywood that doesn't realize it. Wow, yeah. Mm. That's absolutely what uh, mm. what, what the situation was. Well, I mean, you know, similar, I mean, you know, you know, actually kind of, you know, similar to uh, uh, the gigantic response that Liam Neeson got when he did Taken. People just been waiting for him to be in a movie they could see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Hollywood wasn't smart enough to know it. You, you liked uh, Taken, right? Actually, I haven't seen Taken, frankly, to tell you. Oh, right. <laughs> I didn't care for it. <laughs> yeah, that's well, that's I, why I, I brought it up. I was wondering. It. Hey, uh, Stephen Philly in capital letters, so we have to ask this. Ask him why Kurt Russell and Sasha Baron... Uh, Cohen dropped out mm-hmm. of the new movie here. Uh, yeah, basically what happened was, uh, in the case of uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, he's a great guy, and I'd love to work with him. Uh, it was simply the fact that I ended up dropping that sequence. Mm. It was a scene I just knew, ah, this will never make the movie. Yeah. And I just I don't have the days and the time and the money to spend on something that I know is going to get dropped from the editing room. So I had to call him and just let him know, look, uh, it's just not going to work out. I just, I just know the scene ain't going to make the finished film. Mm. The movie's too long as it is, you know. So that was why that worked out. And then uh, the other, and with, with Kurt, Kurt is a great guy and he's a good friend. I knew I was going to have to cut his character way down. Oh, okay. you know, I'd already, I'd already done a lot of the movie. I knew how much I pretty much had left, and if anything had, and if I was going to lose it from anywhere, it would have been from his character. Uh-huh. So I kind of let him know, look, the part you know, by the, you know. Was it you know five months or six months after I'd given him the role? We've been doing the movie for a long time, mm-hmm. so now we're getting into the tail end, is where he would be coming in, and I just knew it was going to be shortened so much. So I I, I gave him the um I I told him that laid it out to him, and uh, we just decided uh, uh maybe this is not the one. Did the yeah. character make the final the final cut? Oh yeah, it's Walt Goggins' character. Which what which which? Oh, he was uh, the guy the, the castration guy that Billy Crash. Oh the, God, the, yeah, that guy yeah. was great. Yeah, he's fantastic. Oh, that's a horrifying the, fucking. Scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Horrifying. I love this inside stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt Russell probably should have taken that, even though that guy was great because that oh, was an yeah, amazing maybe. character. He was dark. And who was hateable in the movie? Again, brilliant. Mm-hmm. I didn't recognize Samuel Jackson until wow. his mouth opened and he spoke. I didn't know it was him. Oh, really? And yeah. he was, again, repugnant. His character. <laughs> so well played. I, I've never hated him in a movie before. Oh, uh, Sam is. He's the theatrical beast in oh. this movie. He comes in and just. Just takes hold of the movie, and you really just, it just grabs your attention and never lets go. Yeah, you you really want to fucking burn him alive in this movie. He's a <laughs> terrible guy, and uh, you kind of understand why he is the way yeah, he uh-huh. is. But uh, I didn't think you could hate him. Is there like, any uh, feet feet in this movie? No, no, not really. <laughs> oh, no. none. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> a lot of poor black blistered feet walking through mud yeah. and rocks. No, no, no <laughs> cute feet. Well that, yeah, no. well, that doesn't make you happy. No, sir. not at all. <laughs> That, that means you're really dedicated to your work. <laughs> I, I've always, I thought you would have pretty feet in this movie. <laughs> I've always wondered if you ever expand on a, a story with no intention of it going anywhere but your own satisfaction. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was watching Pulp Fiction, and of course Zed is laying on the on the floor mm-hmm. bleeding from the crotch. Uh, and he is ready to have some serious shit put down on him. <laughs> Did you ever expand upon what happens to him after Butch leaves and the hard pipe hitting niggas do show up? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever dwell on that yourself? Do you ever do that? Oh, well, I, 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 no, I, I usually ask myself uh, certain questions uh, about. I actually think the movie keeps on going on after the scene stops. Exactly. And, uh, That's... Ab- absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, in that case, I didn't take it out to the complete scenario of exactly what they did, <laughs> yeah. you know, for the next 90 minutes or three hours or whatever, and how they disposed of the body <laughs> yeah. or how many different pieces the body was in when right. they were finished. Uh, but, you know, uh, it did involve pliers and a blowtorch. Right, yeah, yeah. And you can only imagine. <laughs> what Anthony's tell you is that he puts a ball in his own mouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> and wax off thinking about being bent over a sawhorse. <laughs> oh, and that, by the way, that's another thing that I've always been curious about, and you rarely get the chance to speak to the guy. Um, I noticed with the ball gags, Bruce Willis had his a lot further in his mouth than Bing did. Did Bing have a gagging problem? Because <laughs> it really was much further out in his mouth. <laughs> I had, I didn't really clap that. I have to say, I, I, I will, I will, I will check that out next time. Please do. Please that should do. make the bloopers real. <laughs> when you, when you, uh, when you do something like this, and you start to hear controversy swirling around language. Do you ever think bad press is going to hurt you, or do you think that any press for the film is okay? Or do you, do you ever have like those panic moments that we get? Mm. Uh, well, I mean. This kind of movie, this kind of movie is a hot potato, so you mm -hmm. you got to be prepared for that going in, or else you're just you know you're you're just completely unawares. Um, but you know I don't really take any of that seriously. I mean, for the thing you know thing is, if the movie's a lightning rod. It's going to uh, get criticism and it's going to get praise. All right, so yeah. some people will like it and some people and some people won't. That's fine. But, you know, where I'm coming from, you have a problem with it. It's just a movie. Don't go see it. So right, right. Else, you know. Um, but at the same time. It's the flashpoint of right now. Yeah, yeah the movie's mm -hmm. controversial because it's coming out right now and everyone's talking about it. It's at the forefront of everyone's mind because there's a big pre-release going on onto it. So, and that's what's kind of put under a microscope. Mm. But uh, that all goes away. Seven months from now, it's going to be on Showtime. How right, right. You'll be watching it in your living room at 4 o'clock in, in the afternoon. How fucking controversial can it be? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's... Uh, it, it's not made to, to pander to anything either. It's not, you, you're not putting things in it to be like, oh, I'm going to shock some people yeah. here. It's part of the story. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's legitimately. Like, yeah, I mean, literally, you know, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure this movie won't get a touch of the controversy that, say, Ken Russell got when he did The Devils, mm -hmm. you know, when it was released in particularly like in England or any uh, Clockwork Orange or anything like that. But then after that flashpoint is over, now this is we live in a world where Django and Chain already exist. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, in your living room at four in yeah, the afternoon. Right, right, yeah. there Are there any is. scenes that make you want to like there's one scene in the movie that makes me uncomfortable I can think of it's it's the rape scene in irreversible mm -hmm. makes me uncomfortable to yeah, watch yeah. I mean I'll watch it but it's yeah, yeah. so horrific and is there anything you watch scene wise that kind of affects you like that oh yeah no no I mean no there's there's hard stuff to watch hmm. for sure and you know and when I've whenever I've seen anything that was um, like really repugnant and it's really turned me yeah you know, has turned me off yeah I've I'll, I'll call it that I don't say they don't have the right to do it mm -hmm. But I don't like it, you know, <laughs> and I don't ever need to watch it. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, you know, there's, you know, certain, you know, but I, I, I actually do think for the most part, uncomfortable is a, that's a good adjective to describe for that. I actually think, you know, when people start using, oh, I was offended by this. I was offended by that. I kind of feel about that the way, uh, 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 patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Mm -hmm. You know, I think offense is the last refuge of a uh, small mind. Yeah. You know, fuck being offended. What are you talking about? It's a movie. You like it, you don't like it. You don't right. want to watch it, you you want to watch it. Un uncomfortable is definitely uh, unpleasant and I don't want to subject myself to it. Fair enough. But fuck you in offense. But offended. Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. You. <laughs> the yeah. kind of thing that because I watched this, year, I wasn't offended by it at all. Mm -hmm. I, I recognized how brilliantly it was acted mm -hmm. and how how great that was that they did that. But it made me fucking cringe to like the, to right. just the graphic nature of that rape. I was like, that was just well done. And then you know there is you know and, but you know, there is this thing like that where he knows you know Gas that's Gaspar no he knows exactly what he's doing with that and that mm -hmm. movie's not made for everybody. It's made for the people who can go on that journey, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, you know, something else like that could be. I mean, I love this movie, by the way, and I love this sequence. Uh, but I watch it burn audiences down like crazy. Is uh, Takashi McKay's audition? The uh, Have you ever seen that the mm -hmm. Japanese no, movie? No, no. Audition? Oh, it's one of the really, really strong movies. Strong and and yeah. uh, quite a masterpiece, actually. Uh, that's uh, you know, come out in the last twenty years. You guys should definitely check it out. But one of the things, especially, I mean. It's not the same thing watching it on DVD. Watching it in a room full of strangers. <laughs> yeah. This sequence towards the end gets so fucking rough. And, and, and he hasn't prepared you for it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of the genius of it. Right, right, right. Right. But you actually feel the audience getting madder. Wow. And matter. Like there is going to be like it, there's going to be a riot, maybe. And, there's the, you know, and, and then all of a sudden... 
And it's and he's done it in a few different movies, so it's not just a, a, a happy accident. He did mm -hmm. it in the movie they called Ichi the Killer. After daring the audience to actually attack the screen and, you know, charge the projection room and burn the prints, he does this one little tiny thing and the whole audience laughs. Wow. wow. Oh, shit. And then That's from cool. that point on, you get it. And from that point on, you see it through different glasses. And it's actually well, what we were talking about, my stuff. It's one of the wildest leaps I've ever seen anyone do as far as orchestrating an audience. It's, you guys should check it out. It's oh, cool. yeah. What's the name again? Audition. The audition. Right. Audition. Okay. Oh, audition. Is there is there any scene that you've tried to do that with in any of your films that you look back and you go, wow, I wish I would have made that transition a little bit better or that didn't get the reaction in the final cut that I kind of wanted it to? Uh, no, not in, not, in the, not in those terms. I've never quite gone quite to the level of grotesquery all right, <laughs> that he goes in this um, in that. Uh, I've just, you know... <clears throat> I'm just uh, which what's uh, 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 I'm uh, uh, I'm greedy, all right. You know, so if I if I want people to cheer Django at the end, if they're not cheering loud enough, I'm mad at them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. How many movies do you see a week these days? Well, these days hardly anything actually. Hardly? All right, yeah, because mm. I've been uh, yeah, I've been making this movie for a long time, and we literally just kind of finished it about. But two when you're in between ago. movies, just doing more. Oh, behind. I see a lot of movies. I see a lot. Of How movies. many a week would you say? I don't really count it out like that, mm. but a, a lot, a lot. I mean, I go to the movies, and I'm also, you know, I, I watch stuff. Uh, I have a big video collection, yeah. big DVD collection, and you know, I'm taping movies off of television. I mean, one of the things that I actually like to do is I like getting uh, getting on a kick, getting on, uh, you know, l liking a director um, uh, and, or an actor or a subgenre or something, and then just diving into their oeuvre, <laughs> all right, for about two weeks or three oh, weeks. Wow, yeah. And just watching all, you know, all their movies and making notes about them. And, and wow. uh, it, it's like I'm going, you know, and, and, and it's fun. Then I, I get over it and uh, make my notes and put them aside and then go on to the next thing. I make a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making notes. I'm just... <laughs> yeah, it's a great movie. I'm a zilch. Uh, I'm, usually, yeah, I'm, I'm usually watching it with a Jack Daniels and soda water. <laughs> I think we got to wrap up. Yes, they're telling oh, us we have it. to wrap it up. Uh, There's the guy with the vaudeville hook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to do my big acting audition for Quentin, too. I'll have to do it next time. Oh, I'm Jimmy. fucking terrific. All right. <laughs> um, I, it's the, I loved this movie. I loved Django. Um, it was brilliant yeah. and funny and, and, and sad. and It was everything. It's one of the best things you've ever done. And emotionally, I think by far it's the best thing I've ever seen you do. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Where, I, like, I, really, I really mean that. It's like I cannot believe the reaction mm. from one scene to the next. Totally unpredictable. And uh, I mean, what can you say? It's out uh, Christmas, 25th. Christmas, Christmas Day. Christmas it, Day. Uh, yeah. Competing with Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, an amazing movie. Yep. Amazing movie. Great. Quentin, Quentin goddamn, always fun to have you in always here. Always a blast coming Love with it. you guys. Love Absolutely. It. I think we're done. You, you need anything, Jimmy? Oh, yeah. My pre sale for uh, my show with Artie Lang, Amy Schumer, and David Tell goes on sale today. It's February 17th in oh, the God. Borgata. So, uh, or February 11th, whatever it is. <laughs> Password is antisocial. Uh, yeah. Tell Amy Schumer I have a bit of a crush on her. Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> sure. I'm filming a little something with her tomorrow, so okay. I'll, I'll let her oh, know. Yeah, you let it go. I'll yes. let her know. Yeah. He's making a snuff film with her. She doesn't know yet. <laughs> 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 it's not going to get better than that. Quentin Tarantino, thank you, sir. Thanks, guys.